This is a Saddleback Church podcast. Hey friends, and welcome back to Doable Discipleship, a Saddleback Church podcast designed to help you deepen your faith, or as we love to call it, the show that helps you grow. Just a friendly reminder that this podcast is a part of the Saddleback family of podcasts, so you can find out information about all of the wonderful podcasts from Saddleback Church at saddleback.com slash podcasts. Um, friends, I'm I'm especially excited today because I am getting to have a conversation with uh, a Dr. Todd Hall. And uh, he wrote a book that our team has recently just read called The Connected Life. And we loved it so much that I was like, okay, I got to get Todd on here to talk about this book. And and especially in related to our, our conversation that we're having on relational health. So Todd, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate having you here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on, Jason. I'm excited to have this conversation. And I, I wanted to mention up front, I'll mention it at the end too, but I want to mention up front, friends, um, I'm going to put a link to this book in the show notes below and not just any old link. This is going to be a special link that will get you a discount um, to buy the book through the publisher. So thank you, IVP, for that discount information. And so you can do that. It's only running for a limited amount of time for a few weeks. So make sure to check that out. If you're listening to this episode late, sorry, I still buy the book. (laughs) And we'll have a different link on there to send you to the book directly. You can also... If, if you if, if you are looking for a much more academic approach to what we're going to be talking about today, you can also check out Todd's other book called Relational Spirituality, which is the more academic version of the trade book that we're going to be talking a little bit more about today. Um, so and, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. So, Todd, the overall topic that we want to get to today is kind of looking at this idea of how our relationship with God affects our relationship with others. Now, I wanted to I wanted to ask you if you could just give a brief primer for people on the topic of attachment theory. It's probably something people have heard of, but they may not kind of understand what it is that we're talking about. So, can you offer a little bit of an overview of what that means? Sure, Jason. Yeah. So, attachment theory is um, it's really about this idea that we become attached to parents or caregivers early on in life and that it's kind of an inborn need. And usually this is in place by 12 months of age. And the way you can tell somebody's attached, and I know we'll probably get into this a little bit later, but to parents and, you know, caregivers, uh, you know, and to God is that as children, especially, but even throughout all of life, we rely on attachment figures for two primary things. One is what attachment theory calls a haven of safety. So when you're distressed, upset, ill, feel threatened, these are the people that we go to for comfort, right? And the other thing is called a secure base. And so that's, um, you know, when there has been a, a haven of safety and you can trust your caregivers, your parents for comfort and you know they're gonna be there, then you feel safe to explore the world. And they also, you know, encourage you to explore the world. So it's really those two main things. So haven of safety, secure base, sometimes I refer to them as comfort and challenge, you know, challenge in in a positive sense of encouraging you to explore the world. Those are really the two things that we rely on, uh, rely on our attachment figures Mm. for. And so they really kind of form our, our sense of self and then how we relate at a very deep level. So those get, those patterns get internalized and they're secure and insecure forms of attachment, which we'll probably talk about. Yeah. Uh, and they, they really shape how we feel about ourselves and how we relate to others, including God. Well, I, and I think that's a point that people probably, uh, or I should say may not have kind of th- thought about before. I think people can understand the idea of attachment theory as it relates to kids with parents, especially, you know, the idea of that nurturing element that idea of of thriving for kids that 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 have to ha- have contact with parents from an early age and that constant love and attention, um, but the idea of attachment to God might, might be kind of new for some of our listeners. Um, it might sound a little confusing. So, can you talk a little bit about what attachment to God means specifically, and 
and how we can, you know, either know or assess and how we are attached to God? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question, Jason. It's, you know, do, do we become attached to God? Does our relationship with God function like an attachment relationship? Yeah. And I, I think from our own experience, the answer to that is, is yes. And there's also quite a bit of research on this going back to all the way back to the 1960s. There's quantitative, quantitative research looking at how people describe their relationship with God. And people tend to describe their relationship with God in very personal and relational terms. Also just, you know, when you look at in scripture, in terms of how God is described, it's very similar to an attachment figure um, that, you know, someone that we can, we can turn to in times of distress, right? Yeah. And, and that we can go to for comfort. And we do tend to do that. I think we know from our own experience, and again, also from research that we tend to turn to God when we experience loss through, you know, all kinds of different ways, through death or divorce or emotional crisis. And um, there's also, interview research that kind of has confirmed that too, that people tend to describe their relationship with God, like an attachment uh, relationship. And, and and we've already talked a little bit about, yeah. How do you know if you're attached, if you find yourself turning to God, for example, through prayer, mm. when you're distressed and, and looking for comfort and kind of relying on God to uh, help you explore and try new things, then you're probably, you know, have an attachment relationship to God. And there's a, there's a kind of a closeness to that bond. Mm. I think there's something uh, interesting because I think we see it often people who, you know, either they, they only go to God when something is, is so dire. Right. And, and that's kind of, it's, it, it, um, it's, it, it's something that we see a lot like in movies or TV shows. Oh, that character has never once mentioned God. And yet here we find them in this, in this state of, of, uh, distress right and they look to god and say god god why is this happening or god help me out here that's that's a little bit different i think than what you're talking about and related to an, a true attachment relationship to god is that is that correct right right yeah if there if there's not an ongoing relationship and they turn to god in the crisis that that may be the beginning though of sure. developing an attachment yeah. relationship yes definitely but um but when there's an attachment relationship yeah there's an ongoing aspect that it get it just gets activated more when there's distress, but yeah. there's even when the person's not distressed, they still are connecting to God, relying on yeah. God for you know lesser kinds of distress and mm. and also you know just yeah encouragement and um, yeah just ongoing connection and companionship. Yeah, I wanted to mention in the book. You write, um, it says, there is a, a close link between the connection crisis in our society and the spiritual disconnection many people experience in their sense of self and relationship with God and others. And so that link between social disconnection and spiritual disconnection might not seem apparent to most of us. So, so what are we missing as we think about that? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question, Jason. Yeah, social disconnection, I think, does have a profound impact on our experience of God and spiritual community. And so I think this connection crisis that I talk about in our society really has led to a parallel spiritual connection crisis, if you will. So it does raise this interesting question of why does this happen? How does this happen? Yeah. And in the book, I tell a little bit of my story, if you remember, mm -hmm. about kind of my own disconnection and what got me into this um, line of work and, and my own healing. And so the, the short, really quick version is my mom struggled with a lot of mental health issues when I was growing up pretty young. Uh, my parents split up when I was about nine, my mom left the family. So that led to a lot of disconnection. And because of that, I developed strategies to avoid my emotional pain or cope with it, if you will, mm -hmm. and to develop some kind of a pseudo connection with the authority figures or caregivers in my life. And, and, and I think we're going to come back to that yeah. whole idea of pseudo connection. And so the reason I tell that, Jason, is because we all do that. We all develop these strategies, mostly subconsciously, to cope with emotional pain and maintain some kind of pseudo connection to the important people in our lives or attachment figures. And, you know, so some examples, we might become overly self-reliant. And that's sort of one attachment style dismissing that we can talk about mm. so that we don't bother others. Or we might become a people pleaser or an achiever, right, to try to earn people's love. And this is all operating subconsciously. And so these strategies are defense mechanisms and they backfire. And I think we'll unpack that more later as well. But I think the, the answer to your question, the point here is that as believers, these strategies play out 
in our relationship with God mm. because the way we connect to God is the same way we connect to other to human attachment figures. It's this gut level implicit kind of uh, relationship and connection. And so we have the same expectations mm-hmm. of God as we do of our human attachment figures. Yeah. And so these strategies play out with God. Mm, that's good. So let's talk about that pseudo connection now. Can you can you unpack for us just the difference between pseudo connection then and in what a deep, healthy connection is? Sure. Yeah. So what I mean by pseudo connection is that it's part of a strategy to protect ourselves from pain. Mm-hmm. So it's it's very understandable. We we all do it. <laughs> I deal a lot with this with yeah. you know clients in therapy and training students to do therapy, and and we all do this. So it's not that you know we're talking about this in a judgmental way. It's just that it's not healthy, mm-hmm. um, because what ends up happening is we sort of have to cut off part of ourselves, mm-hmm. um, our our own feelings, our own experiences, and this then hinders our ability to connect in an authentic way. And so in contrast, a healthier, secure attachment is when you bring your genuine feelings to the relationship, you're comfortable with emotional intimacy. So these are all parts of what we call secure attachment, right? Yeah. You're comfortable with emotional intimacy. You're able to be vulnerable with others, but still manage your emotions and not just become completely unhinged, so to speak, right? And there's a balanced reliance on yourself, but also on others. You can reach out when you need help, when you're distressed, right? you're able to receive love and care, but you're also able to give care and love Mm. to others. And there's kind of a genuine confidence that comes from this emotional security, right? That if I feel worthy of love, then I can receive your care and love. Mm -hmm. And then I also feel that my love and care is important and can make a difference, Mm. right? And so then I can give that to to others. Mm. So uh, those points, I I think, and again, I think we so often associate all um, all of this uh, attachment type talk and those signs of secure attachment or the inverse of those would being the the, the um, insecure attachment and we usually associate those in terms of our relationship with our parents like that seems to be the common go-to for people is they can think about either themselves as a kid growing up or even now currently, but I wanted to just ask you a little bit about how how those play out in our relationships with like our peers, with our friends. Is that something that we see see play out in in those areas too? You mentioned in in the end of your book, the last chapter of the book is called "Born to Belong," and you were talking about um, about the importance of small groups and the importance of a church life and a church and a a, a healthy church environment. And so I was just curious if you can share how those things play out in those environments as well, not just so, so to, to, to help our listeners frame it, not just in a parent kid relationship, but in a friend relationship. Yeah, definitely. It definitely plays out in, you know, with friends, peers and spiritual community. So, um, it's, so this is kind of a broader, wider view of attachment if you will, it Mm -hmm. plays out probably mostly, most strongly, I guess, with uh, parental figures, authority figures, God, who's a, you know, authority figure. But, you know, our our general attachment styles or tendencies or patterns, whatever you want to call those, really does shape all of our important relationships. So so definitely friendships and peers, and we can actually become attached to peers, uh, and definitely romantic relationships, spouses, partners, um, those can become attachment relationships, right? Where we rely on them for comfort and encouragement yeah. and safety and things like that. So it definitely plays out in that realm with peers and also at, at a community level with spiritual community. There's these general expectations um, about how relationships go for us based on our experience, which is based on this, you know, gut level sort of memory mm-hmm. based on our experiences. And so those ex- especially get sort of played out with, with spiritual authority figures, pastors, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as well as just kind of the community in general. So Mm -hmm. if you take for, as an example, client I worked with for many years, history of severe trauma, you know, when she would go to church, she would be on the alert and kind of expect abandonment, you know, and, um, so that would impact how she would 
relate to others and and cause you know some difficulties that we had to to process so that you know gets better as we grow and heal but it definitely plays out in that realm mm. so what would be some symptoms or signs of spiritual disconnection yeah so in general it would just be feeling distant from god or feeling like god's not involved in your life or doesn't care about you know the specifics of your life or, or you in a, in a very personal realm, even though we, you know, we see that throughout scripture that God does care about the details of our lives and in a personal realm, but sometimes we don't feel that way. And that's oftentimes because of, you know, past experiences with parents and authority figures. So you may know a lot of things about God. You may know, you know, theology and scripture, but you don't experience God's love or forgiveness. Yeah. Uh, and that may cause you to, you know, not turn to God when you're distressed or suffering, that kind of thing. So that's kind of in a general sense. And then there's these different types of insecure attachment that I've alluded to. And so it's going to play out differently with those different types. So dismissing attachment is is a style or pattern of attachment mm -hmm. where people kind of shut down their attachment system. So they tend to have experienced a lot of neglect. And so they sort of learned early on, I can't rely on other people, parents, you know, authority figures in particular, to be there for me to meet my needs to comfort me so they become very self-sufficient and so they they tend to avoid people and relationships especially when they're distressed and need help they shut down and they become even more self-sufficient but interestingly on the surface they're kind of composed so there's two two dimensions that we sort of look at to kind of come up with these attachment categories and so for dismissing it's relational avoidance but they're emotionally composed they don't show distress mm. uh, but it's kind of a pseudo composure if you will yeah. uh, so they have difficulty feeling emotionally close to god and depending on god because of that self-sufficiency anxious attachment or it's sometimes called preoccupied attachment is kind of an opposite style and that's where people kind of over hyperactivate or overactivate their attachment system to try to get their needs met so they tend to have experienced a lot of inconsistent care Sometimes parents were there for them, sometimes they weren't. And so they learned a strategy of becoming very, you know, needy and clingy and activating their attachment system in order to sometimes get some kind of response, right? Mm. But generally they they fear and expect abandonment. Mm. The people in their life and with God. And so that's, you know, that's what kind of what disconnection is going to look like for them. They they will feel abandoned by God, expect abandonment that he's, God's not going to really be there for them. Um, and then there's this fearful attachment, which tends to be associated with trauma or abuse. And so there's a desire for connection, but a fear of closeness and vulnerability because it's often associated with, you know, very painful, abusive kinds of uh, experiences. Yeah. And so, so disconnection is going to look, look like that for people in this fearful tendency where there's this, you know, desire, but, but also fear of vulnerability and sort of withdrawing. Mm. So I'm I, I'm curious is there is there a more commonly seen or I should say a more commonly seen way in which either our relationships with others affect our relationship with God or vice versa our relationship with God affects our relationships with others is there one that we see as a more common um, flow of the spectrum or is it just kind of or is, does it kind of all affect each other in, in a way. Yeah, I, I think it is bi-directional, Jason. I think it goes both ways and our human relationships affect our relationship with God and how we attach to God and vice versa. Our relationship with God uh, definitely affects our attachment, how we feel about ourselves and that kind of thing. I think it's a little bit easier to see the direction from, you know, how our human relationships impact our relationship with God because we can we can sort of see the patterns a little bit more easily with people. Sure and then see how that plays out in those experiences. But that is something, yeah, I remind people a lot um, because sometimes when I talk about this topic in the church, there's this, you know, misunderstanding or feeling that, oh, are you saying that, you know, everything's reduced to human relationships and that people are, you know, <laughs> if you have these early relationships, you're that determines the rest of your life type of thing, right? Yeah. And the answer is no. Attachment styles, tendencies can and do change. Mm -hmm. We can and do heal and grow. Mm -hmm. And part of the way that happens is through our relationship with God. I mean, it's kind of a, if we assume as Christians and, and experience that 
God is a real person and we have a real relationship with God, despite all the experiences that sometimes are difficult, then yes, God impacts, um, you know, how we feel about ourselves and our other relationships. And so I think that's, I think that's very real and it does go both ways. It's a little bit, maybe, like I said, harder to see and track. Yeah. Well, and I think there's something that sounds, it's so, so, so important and can often get overlooked is that when we go back and kind of put a little more focus on our relationship with God, it's we're going back to our creator, our maker, and the one right. who knows us better than anybody else ever could, and the one who who not only we can have that that personal relationship with, but that we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, working in us, and so so that there's there's a lot to be said about the way that that our our relationship with God and in going back to to our identity sources, identity feelings, and in building from that foundation up can then impact our relationship with others. Now, not to be said that our, how we relate to others and grow and talk with other people can't also then impact our relationship and how we think about God, but there's something special about that, about that going back to the source of all things to, <laughs> right. that then can right. expand outward that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great point, Jason. I think, um, you know, in a sense, very real sense, right? I mean, God is the ultimate attachment figure. And even though we don't fully experience it, we know at some level through scripture Mm -hmm. and through the body of Christ, right? The new family of God, that God is love, right? And that's how God is described in scripture and that he's, he's not, he doesn't, ultimately let us down in the ways that human beings do because he's perfect and he's all loving. We just have to understand that we, we don't always experience that because of our limitations and our humanity. And, you know, and so we have to grow into that, but that does help. Um, as long as we're not discounting people's experiences, I still encourage people, you know, you, you've got to engage in spiritual practices and yeah, there's going to be dry times and difficult times um, but that's part of where that trust comes from is like you said, going back to the source that God is our creator. He loves us unconditionally. He works thing, all things together for good, right? Mm-hmm. Those, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And um, so I think that's, there are times where that's part of the role that faith plays, right? Mm-hmm. Is that we step into these processes, even though there are painful aspects to it, trusting that, God is really good, even if I can't fully feel it and experience it at times, and that there is, that you know, the story really will end well, yeah. <laughs> ultimately. Are there some spiritual practices that you've seen um, can, I, I don't want to say necessarily work better or be more effective, but are there ones that you you have, have engaged with yourself that you've seen um, a bit more of that ability to refocus back on on who you know God is in those hard moments um or I should I should frame it like this what are some good spiritual practices that you would recommend to people um who may want to to um invest in in that in that part of knowing who God is even despite the you know the feeling that that it's not there or that God mm-hmm. isn't for me or whatever you know as we as we can find ourselves in Right, right. Yeah, I think one great practice that that I've done and I have my students do is just kind of a reflective reading on scripture. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's called Lectio Divina, yeah. but just trying to slow down in reading scripture and really experience God in scripture rather than just reading through it to get the, you know, kind of the intellectual understanding, which is important, definitely. Mm-hmm. But a lot of what the book is about is, you know, knowing God relationally, right? That's, that's really ultimately what Christianity and the gospel is a relationship with Christ, yeah. right? Relationship with God through, <clears throat> through Christ. It's not just intellectual ascent, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's part of it, but that, that's got to be packaged together and integrated with knowing God in relationship through Christ. So I think when we slow down and read scripture and, you know, multiple times and reflect on it, that really helps it sink into our heart. And that's, you know, when I talk about the growth process, I talk about a couple aspects of 
bringing these two ways of knowing together. So we've got explicit knowledge or head knowledge and then this gut level implicit knowledge. Yeah. And they're both important. They have to be brought together. And one of the ways is by what I talk about is feeling ideas. Mm. So we're feeling God's truth, right? So all the truth and doctrine and understanding of God in scripture is great, but it's got to sink into our hearts and we've got to feel it. And if you look at, you know, the parables, right? Mm. Jesus taught in parables to help us feel and inhabit God's truth in a deeper way than just knowing them intellectually, you know, um, the, so I think yeah, slowing down and reading God, reading scripture more slowly and reflecting on it is one way to, uh, to do that. Um, yeah. And I talk about in the book, um, another thing that comes to mind is just growing through suffering and, and just the practice of lament, which is something that yeah. is not very common in evangelical traditions. Um, you know, we tend to focus more on the triumph of Christ and that kind of thing, which, which is, there's a place for that, but there's a place to acknowledge and process suffering and yeah. lament, so you know, 40% of the Psalms called are lamentations. lamentations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Psalms lamentations. So there's, there's a, there's a structure for this in scripture and, um, and, and lament really is kind of a, a stylized form of speech consisting of common elements that have a trajectory and so they move us psychologically through an address to God, a pouring out of our suffering to God, a request to alleviate the suffering, and then they end with an expression of trust in God. So if you look at the Psalms of Lament, you'll see this structure, and it's really designed to move us psychologically to help us express our, our faith and hold on to it even in difficult times. Is that then, is is there is there almost it's probably not a direct cause and effect, but is there then a, a greater likelihood if, if you enter into that understanding of I, like, I can have this type of relationship with God too, where I can lament and I can come to him in these moments. Is, is there then a greater likelihood that you find yourself more able to share the things that grieve you or that are, are, are troubling you with others? Yes. Yeah, I think so. I think so. That's, that's part of what we talked about earlier about how our relationship with God can impact yeah. how we relate to, to hum, other human beings and how we feel about ourselves that, yeah, as that trust grows and we feel that God is there and that he can handle expressing, you know, this, this, these painful things and suffering to him, which we see in scripture, right? Yeah. Um, then I, I think that that begins to reshape our implicit sense of self and feeling worthy of love and impacts the way we relate to others. Mm -hmm. And importantly, Jason, I mean, I think one of the big important results of that is it, it helps us to create space for other people mm -hmm. for their suffering. Right. Yeah. If, if I'm trying to push down my suffering because it's overwhelming me and I haven't processed it. And then you come to me with some suffering that's going to activate my own suffering. Sure. Right. It's going to remind me of it. And so subconsciously, I'm going to work really hard to move you away from your suffering. I'm going to try to reassure you. I'm going to try to talk you out of it or just kind of flat out avoid it. Yeah. So it's, I think that's a really important result. Mm. In the book, you talk about um, some ways that, that don't work to improve our attachment to God. You talk about the willpower approach that's trying harder. You talk about the intellectual approach knowing more and you talk about the spiritual emotional high approach which just means like feeling better <laughs> um so so can you talk I, a little bit about why these won't work sure yeah yeah and so the the first thing i want to just clarify and point out about those uh, approaches jason is that they they're good in and of themselves right so i want to make sure that's clear that i'm not saying you know effort's not important <laughs> sure. or you know knowing things about god these are all important right spiritual growth requires effort right yeah it requires you know understanding something about god and the gospel right and it and then a spiritual high as a result of seeing god work or something like that is a, is a wonderful thing that's great it's just so what i'm talking about here are the problem is when we use those approaches to push away our pain mm. as a defense mechanism to keep our pain at bay because then what it does is it cuts off part of ourselves, right? These experiences, these painful emotions, it cuts us off from that. And then that cuts us off from other people. 
then I can't be as authentic with you. I can't bring that into my relationship with you. I'm not saying that you have to share everything with everybody, of course, but just that it's not accessible to me yeah. to then bring that into relationship <clears throat> with other people. So that's, that's where the relational approach comes in. It integrates all of these, but it's in the context of a loving relationship with God and others where your spiritual spirituality empowers you to face your pain with the help of loving relationships with mm-hmm. God and others and, and, and to grow, you know, through that. What are some good tips for people who want to be more intentional about the relational approach? Um, are there some some practices, some kind of exercises, or, or just some tips for people who may want to, like, say, you know, think, I, I, I really want to make sure I'm trying that, that I'm, I'm heading towards that, that I'm not just focused on willpower, intellectual, spiritual, emotional high, but I want to make sure I'm doing it in that right kind of context. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so maybe first is define, like, what do we mean by, um, you know, a more healthy, you know, um, connection. I mean, we kind of talked about that before, but where you're comfortable with emotional intimacy, yeah. you're able to have, um, reach out to others and that kind of thing. But in terms of, so if you're talking about how do we grow toward more secure attachment, right? With God yeah. and with other people. Yeah. I, so I think at a sort of a macro level, there's a few processes. I would, I would say one is, as I mentioned, engage in spiritual disciplines and practices mm-hmm. regularly, even when Things feel dry. Um, that's where faith comes in. And also understanding that we don't always see growth when it's happening, that there's incremental growth happening below the surface that's hard to see. Mm-hmm. And then what happens is at certain times, things coalesce and there'll be a shift kind of in the landscape of our soul. And this implicit, you know, sort of gut level knowledge that we've talked about will change and shift. But we've got to keep engaging in those practices. So that's one thing. Uh, and then I would say, you know, again, at a sort of macro level for people to encourage them to reflect on your attachment tendencies and how you tend to protect yourself from pain. Mm. So there's going to be some general uh, patterns that go along with these attachment patterns I've talked about, mm-hmm. but it's helpful to even get more specific than that, right? So, I mean, how do you specifically tend to protect yourself from pain and how does that become, even though it's understandable, how does that become counterproductive, you know, in your relationships and then develop work on developing secure based relationships, right? So who are the people in your life, Jason, you know, that you can trust. There's something there that, that there's a mutuality mm-hmm. you can maybe build on. And I would say invest in those relationships. And then, and then also think about, you know, there's some relationships that are more difficult. And so you need to think about having appropriate boundaries and may, that may not necessarily mean cutting someone off, but just having appropriate boundaries but finding the people that can be your secure base relationships and that can really invest in you and you can invest in them and, and have a sense of mutuality. And then I would say find sanctuary spaces and ways that you particularly based on your personality and this stage in your life feel tend to feel connected to God and feel renewed spiritually. Maybe that's walks in nature, you know, maybe that's, reading scripture for longer periods of time, but, you know, things that help you feel a sense of calm and peace in God's presence. And then I would say, and these are very, very high level, right? But make space for grief, you know, that we're all grief and loss is just part of our life, you know, particularly in the last few years with, with COVID and everything. And it's important to process that. So, so that's kind of at a macro level. And then, you know, unpacking that at a more micro level sure. when you're, you know, especially upset or something, you know, there's some distress or whatever, I think, there's a few steps you can go through. So the first one would be observe and reflect on your feelings, Mm. right? So when something's really kind of churning, take a step back, slow down, observe and reflect on your feelings and ask yourself, you know, what am I feeling? Where are you feeling it in your body? Mm -hmm. That helps you to get out of being sort of entrenched in the feeling and then label it. So this is part of the, two ways of knowing working together, which I call the knowledge spiral, right? Labeling your feelings, putting them to words so you can talk about them can be super helpful. And then identify your core wounds and unmet needs. So what are these feelings about, right? I mean, there's the surface event, but oftentimes there's a deeper wound and need that is playing out. And so try to think about, you know, what, what is that, um, 
deeper wound and need, and then identify micro steps to reverse this negative pattern. What are, what are small steps you can take to begin to reverse the pattern of protecting yourself and developing new patterns in relationships? I'll give you a quick example, a client who I'll call Frank, not his real name, but yeah. um, had an, ex- an experience where he came in one time, was you know frustrated and angry with his wife. He, they'd had an interchange where you know he had talked about something he was really trying to, he was interested in developing this hobby and he felt kind of blown off. And so he was just angry and then, but also hurt underneath that. And so as we talked about that, you know, I helped him go through these steps like, okay, what are you, what are you feeling? So he was able to identify feeling angry and hurt. And then what were the wounds or, you know, sort of unmet needs under that? It really, what was driving that because it wasn't, you know, the issue itself wasn't huge. What was driving that was this relationship with his father Mm. as a child where he felt he had no voice. His fa- he felt like his father didn't know him. There was no sort of personal aspect to the relationship. Mm-hmm. He wasn't, there were no discussions about his life or direct. He was just sort of told, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. There was no discussion. He felt like he didn't have a voice and he wasn't valued. And that was the feeling that got activated mm-hmm. in this conversation mm-hmm. with his wife. So when he was able to realize that, that created some space and freed him up to think about, okay, how can I then think about, you know, a small step where I can move in a different direction and foster a different experience. Right. And so for him, that was instead of his, his tendency was to shut down and avoid, right. Mm -hmm. I don't have a voice. People don't care. My dad didn't. And so I'm just going to withdraw and shut down and be angry and bitter, but I'm not going to, you know, and hurt, but not going to bring it to people. So he was able to go back to his wife share this experience, what he was feeling. Mm. And to his surprise, to some extent, she was very responsive because mm. she didn't know all this was going on. Right. Mm. <laughs> and so it created a, you know, a real sense of connection and a new experience for him. So that's just a little small example of, but there, I think there's these global again, macro processes, but there's these little steps or processes that people can take to just really observe and reflect on your feelings yeah identify the core wounds and unmet needs that are underneath it and then start to figure out the new steps to reverse the cycles. Mm. Is there, is there a tool um, that you would recommend for people to help them understand their attachment types better? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a number of them out there. I do happen to have my own assessment tool. If people want to check that out. So um, it's at, uh, they can go to spiritualtransformation.org. Um, or spiritualmetrics.co, and it's called the Spiritual Transformation Inventory. Okay. And so that um, I use that with, you know, clients and and people as well as with schools. But there, there's a group level report, but there's an individual report that has attachment scales built in that will give and it gives feedback yeah. on, um, yeah, on kind of the different attachment styles with God as well as with other people, mm-hmm. and and it has soul projects built in, mm-hmm. which are specific passages and ask them to kind of reflect on the feedback and pray through it and then reflect on a passage. And then there's kind of an action step. What are some practices that people can do with others to better improve their relational health? Yeah, I think um, small groups can be really powerful for this to, you know, talk about these attachment patterns with God, Mm -hmm. with other people and, again, you know, sort of create this space to have, have new experiences that can be really uh, powerful as well as, you know, mentoring Mm -hmm. can be very powerful. Um, And, you know, also just engaging in spiritual practices, like this could be again in dyads and, you know, sort of mentoring or peer spiritual friendship kind of relationship or a small group where you're engaging in some practices together and then sharing about your experience of it and reflecting on it. That can be really powerful. For for a small group that is just getting started, it, they're kind of new as a small group. Is there is there something that that they can do or that you would recommend maybe for them to be able to kind of you know start on a path towards deeper relational health and better understanding of each other? You know, especially I'm I'm thinking of people who who may not have have known each other for very long. But you want to create a community that is attached to each other. That is, mm-hmm. um, and so I was. I was just curious if you have any kind of advice or suggestions for for especially in that type of environment for people to start to build stronger bonds to, 
to keep that group mm-hmm. um, alive and healthy moving forward. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I think I think creating a structure with some questions to help people reflect on their attachment with each other, which obviously is vulnerable, right? So, yeah. so it needs to be kind of measured that you don't just jump into maybe like the deepest level <laughs> right away if it's a new small group. Yeah. But you know, there's some initial questions that can help people kind of wade put their foot into this water or toe, so to speak. Um, and that can be as simple as what's one challenging experience you had growing up, Jason, that has shaped your sense of who you are and how you relate to others. Mm. So pretty, pretty broad. And that gives people kind of a range, like some, some people might go deeper, some might keep it a little more, but it's at least fostering a little bit more, you know, vulnerability and then have people reflect on that and kind of respond to each other, you know, have a time of response um, as well. Um, And then you can go deeper into helping, you know, identifying attachment patterns, you know, they could do something like take this spiritual transformation inventory or there's others out there and reflect with each other on the results and how it, you know, how they, how it impacted them, you know, um, their attachment to God, how they see that playing out. Mm. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, one of the things that we're always trying to do is is look for ways to to help our small groups grow deeper together, um, in, in, not just in God's word, but as friends, as as mm-hmm. you know, in, as brothers and sisters. And so that's just one thing that I, I was definitely wanted to make sure that I got to ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, t- Todd, I just want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, you know, I, 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 there's a lot. Our team has a lot of excitement around this topic, around helping people understand how uh, how their attachment types not only impact their relationships with others, but also their relationship with God, and that there are ways to be able to grow deeper in those and develop secure attachments. And so, um, friends, if you have any thoughts or, or questions around this, feel free to email us at, at maturity at saddleback.com. Uh, we would love to field those questions. You're also, I'll, I'm going to mention it again. Go and buy Todd's book, The Connected Life, link in the show notes, special discount link if you buy it in the next uh, two or three weeks. I forget how long it is. And then um, and also his other um more academic book of this relational spirituality um, and in visit spiritual transformation.org. That's right. Is that the right address for that? That's right. Yep. Sweet. We'll put that in the show notes um, as well. Todd, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate your thoughts and your passion around this. It, it's, yeah. it's very helpful. Well, you're welcome. Thank you, Jason. I really appreciate the, the conversation and the focus on this and all the work that, that your team is doing. Yeah. Our, our pleasure, our excitement. Um, friends, we will be back and continue uh, our, um, in talking about relational health. We love you, and uh, we will be back with you again next week. If you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or a review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. You can also listen to these episodes on YouTube. Just subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you are already listening to us on YouTube, subscribe to the Doable Discipleship Podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Don't forget to visit saddleback.com slash doable to check out all of our previous episodes. And go to saddleback.com slash grow to find spiritual growth resources and view a calendar of upcoming events. Lastly, you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions, your Bible questions, your life questions, whatever. Who knows? Your question might just inspire an upcoming episode. Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Jason Whelan, and I hope you'll join us again next week.